principal one, become genuinely interested in other people. 5. A simple way to make a good impression. At a dinner party in New York, one of the guests, a woman who had inherited money, was eager to make a pleasing impression on everyone. She had squandered a modest fortune on sables, diamonds and pearls, but she hadn't done anything whatever about her face. It radiated sourness and selfishness. She didn't realize what everyone knows, namely, that the expression one wears on one's face is far more important than the clothes one wears on one's back. Charles Schwab told me his smile had been worth a million dollars, and he was probably understating the truth. For Schwab's personality, his charm, his ability to make people like him, were almost wholly responsible for his extraordinary success, and one of the most delightful factors in his personality was his captivating smile. Actions speak louder than words, and a smile says, I like you, you make me happy, I am glad to see you. That is why dogs make such a hit. They are so glad to see us that they almost jump out of their skins, so, naturally, we are glad to see them. A baby's smile has the same effect. Have you ever been in a doctor's waiting room and looked around at all the glum faces waiting impatiently to be seen? Dr. Stephen K. Sproul a veterinarian in Raytown, Missouri, told of a typical spring day when his waiting room was full of clients waiting to have their pets inoculated. No one was talking to anyone else, and all were probably thinking of a dozen other things they would rather be doing than wasting time sitting in that office. He told one of our classes, there were six or seven clients waiting when a young woman came in with a nine-month-old baby and a kitten. As luck would have it, she sat down next to a gentleman who was more than a little distraught about the long wait for service. The next thing he knew, the baby just looked up at him with that great big smile that is so characteristic of babies. What did that gentleman do? Just what you and I would do, of course. He smiled back at the baby. Soon he struck up a conversation with the woman about her baby and his grandchildren, and soon the entire reception room joined in and the boredom and tension were converted into a pleasant and enjoyable experience, an insincere grin, no, that doesn't fool anybody, we know it is mechanical and we resent it, I am talking about a real smile, a heartwarming smile, a smile that comes from within, the kind of smile that will bring a good price in the marketplace, Professor James V. McConnell, a psychologist at the University of Michigan, expressed his feelings about a smile. People who smile, he said, tend to manage teach and sell more effectively and to raise happier children. There's far more information in a smile than a frown. That's why encouragement is a much more effective teaching device than punishment. The employment manager of a large New York department store told me she would rather hire a sales clerk who hadn't finished grade school if he or she has a pleasant smile than to hire a doctor of philosophy with a summer face. The effect of a smile is powerful even when it is unseen. Telephone companies throughout the United States have a program called Phone Power, which is offered to employees who use the telephone for selling their services or products. In this program they suggest that you smile when talking on the phone. Your smile comes through in your voice. Robert Cryer, manager of a computer department for a Cincinnati, Ohio, company, told how he had successfully found the right applicant for a hard-to-fill position. I was desperately trying to recruit a PhD in computer science for my department. I finally located a young man with ideal qualifications who was about to be graduated from Purdue University. After several phone conversations I learned that he had several offers from other companies, many of them larger and better known than mine. I was delighted when he accepted my offer. After he started on the job, I asked him why he had chosen us over the others. He paused for a moment and then he said, I think it was because managers and the other companies spoke on the phone in a cold, business-like manner which made me feel like just another business transaction. Your voice sounded as if you were glad to hear from me that you really wanted me to be part of your organization. You can be assured, I am still answering my phone with a smile. The chairman of the board of directors of one of the largest rubber companies in the United States told me that, according to his observations, people rarely succeed at anything unless they have fun doing it. This industrial leader doesn't put much faith in the old adage that hard work alone is the magic key that will unlock the door to our desires. I have known people, he said, 
who succeeded because they had a rip-roaring good time conducting their business. Later, I saw those people change as the fun became work. The business had grown dull. They lost all joy in it, and they failed. You must have a good time meeting people if you expect them to have a good time meeting you. I have asked thousands of business people to smile at someone every hour of the day for a week, and then come to class and talk about the results. How did it work? Let's see here is a letter from William B. Steinhardt, a New York stockbroker. His case isn't isolated, in fact, it is typical of hundreds of cases. One have been married for over 18 years wrote Mr. Steinhardt, and in all that time, I seldom smiled at my wife or spoke two dozen words to her from the time I got up until I was ready to leave for business. I was one of the worst grouches who ever walked down Broadway. When you asked me to make a talk about my experience with smiles, I thought I would try it for a week. So the next morning, while combing my hair, I looked at my glum mug in the mirror and said to myself, Bill, you are going to wipe the scowl off that sour puss of yours today. You are going to smile, and you are going to begin right now. As I sat down to breakfast, I greeted my wife with a good morning, my dear, and smiled as I said it. You warned me that she might be surprised. Well, you underestimated a reaction. She was bewildered. She was shocked. I told her that in the future she could expect this as a regular occurrence, and I kept it up every morning. This changed attitude of mine brought more happiness into our home in the two months since I started than there was during the last year. As I leave for my office, I greet the elevator operator in the apartment house with a good morning and a smile. I greet the doorman with a smile. I smile at the cashier in the subway booth when I ask for change. As I stand on the floor of the stock exchange, I smile at people who until recently never saw me smile. I soon found that everybody was smiling back at me. I treat those who come to me with complaints or grievances in a cheerful manner. I smile as I listen to them, and I find that adjustments are accomplished much easier. I find that smiles are bringing me dollars, many dollars every day. I share my office with another broker. One of his clerks is a likable young chap. And I was so elated about the results I was getting that I told him recently about my new philosophy of human relations. He then confessed that when I first came to share my office with his firm, he thought me a terrible grouch and only recently changed his mind. He said I was really human when I smiled. I have also eliminated criticism from my system. I give appreciation and praise now instead of condemnation. I have stopped talking about what I want, I am now trying to see the other person's viewpoint, and these things have literally revolutionized my life. I am a totally different man, a happier man, a richer man, richer in friendships, and happiness the only things that matter much after all. You don't feel like smiling, then what? Two things. First, force yourself to smile. If you are alone, force yourself to whistle or hum a tune or sing. Act as if you were already happy, and that will tend to make you happy. Here is the way the psychologist and philosopher William James put it. Action seems to follow feeling, but really action and feeling go together, and by regulating the action, which is under the more direct control of the will, we can indirectly regulate the feeling, which is not. Thus the sovereign voluntary path to cheerfulness, if our cheerfulness be lost, is to sit up cheerfully, and to act and speak, as if cheerfulness were already there. Everybody in the world is seeking happiness, and there is one sure way to find it. That is by controlling your thoughts. Happiness doesn't depend on outward conditions, it depends on inner conditions. It isn't what you have or who you are or where you are or what you are doing that makes you happy or unhappy. It is what you think about it. For example, two people may be in the same place, doing the same thing. Both may have about an equal amount of money and prestige, and yet one may be miserable and the other happy. Why? Because of a different mental attitude, I have seen just as many happy faces among the poor peasants toiling with their primitive tools, in the devastating heat of the tropics, as I have seen in air-conditioned offices in New York, Chicago or Los Angeles. There is nothing either good or bad said Shakespeare, but thinking makes it so. 
Abe Lincoln once remarked that most folks are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. He was right. I saw a vivid illustration of that truth as I was walking up the stairs of the Long Island Railroad Station in New York. Directly in front of me 30 or 40 crippled boys on canes and crutches were struggling up the stairs. One boy had to be carried up. I was astonished at their laughter and gaiety. I spoke about it to one of .the men in charge of the boys. Oh, yes he said, when a boy realizes that he is going to be a cripple for life, he is shocked at first, but after he gets over the shock, he usually resigns himself to his fate, and then becomes as happy as normal boys. I felt like taking my hat off to those boys. They taught me a lesson I hope I shall never forget. Working all by oneself in a closed off room in an office not only is lonely, but it denies one the opportunity of making friends with other employees in the company. Senora Maria Gonzalez of Guadalajara, Mexico, had such a job. She envied the shared comradeship of other people in the company as she heard their chatter and laughter. As she passed them in the hall during the first weeks of her employment, she shyly looked the other way. After a few weeks, she said to herself, Maria, you can't expect those women to come to you. You have to go out and meet them. The next time she walked to the water cooler, she put on her brightest smile and said, Hi, how are you today? To each of the people she met. The effect was immediate. Smiles and hellos were returned. The hallway seemed brighter, the job friendlier. Acquaintanceships developed and some ripened into friendships. Her job and her life became more pleasant and interesting. Peruse this bit of sage advice from the essayist and publisher Albert Hubbard, but remember, perusing it won't do you any good unless you apply it. Whenever you go out of doors, draw the chin in, carry the crown of the head high, and fill the lungs to the utmost, drink in the sunshine, greet your friends with a smile, and put soul into every hand clasp. Do not fear being misunderstood and do not waste a minute thinking about your enemies. Try to fix firmly in your mind what you would like to do, and then, without veering off direction, you will move straight to the goal. Keep your mind on the great and splendid things you would like to do, and then, as the days go gliding away, you will find yourself unconsciously seizing upon the opportunities that are required for the fulfillment of your desire. Just as the coral insect takes from the running tide the element it needs, picture in your mind the able, earnest, useful person you desire to be, and the thought you hold is hourly transforming you into that particular individual. Thought is supreme. Preserve a right mental attitude the attitude of courage, frankness, and good cheer. To think rightly is to create. All things come through desire, and every sincere prayer is answered. We become like that on which our hearts are fixed. Carry your chin in and the crown of your head high. We are gods in the chrysalis. The ancient Chinese were a wise lot wise in the ways of the world, and they had a proverb that you and I ought to cut out and paste inside our hats. It goes like this. A man without a smiling face must not open a shop. Your smile is a messenger of your goodwill. Your smile brightens the lives of all who see it. To someone who has seen a dozen people frown, scowl or turn their faces away. Your smile is like the sun breaking through the clouds. Especially when that someone is under pressure from his bosses, his customers, his teachers or parents or children. A smile can help him realize that all is not hopeless that there is joy in the world. Some years ago, a department store in New York City, in recognition of the pressures its sales clerks were under during the Christmas rush, presented the readers of its advertisements with the following homely philosophy. The value of a smile at Christmas. It costs nothing, but creates much. It enriches those who receive without impoverishing those who give. It happens in a flash and the memory of it sometimes lasts forever. None are so rich they can get along without it, and none so poor, but are richer for its benefits. It creates happiness in the home, fosters goodwill in a business, and is the countersign of friends. It is rest to the weary, daylight to the discouraged, sunshine to the sad, and nature's best antidote fee trouble. Yet it cannot be bought, begged, borrowed, or stolen, for it is something that is no earthly good to anybody till it is given away. And if in the last minute rush of Christmas buying some of our salespeople should be too tired to give you a smile, may we ask you to leave one of yours. For nobody needs a smile so much as those who have none left to give. Principle 2. Smile. 6. 
If you don't do this, you are headed for trouble. Back in 1898, a tragic thing happened in Rockland County, New York. A child had died, and on this particular day the neighbors were preparing to go to the funeral. Jim Farley went out to the barn to hitch up his horse. The ground was covered with snow, the air was cold and snappy, the horse hadn't been exercised for days, and as he was led out to the watering trough, he wheeled playfully, kicked both his heels high in the air, and killed Jim Farley. So the little village of Stony Point had two funerals that week instead of one. Jim Farley left behind him a widow and three boys and a few hundred dollars in insurance. His oldest boy, Jim, was 10, and he went to work in a brickyard, wheeling sand and pouring it into the molds and turning the brick on edge to be dried by the sun. This boy Jim never had a chance to get much education, but with his natural geniality, he had a flair for making people like him, so he went into politics, and as the years went by, he developed an uncanny ability for remembering people's names. He never saw the inside of a high school. But before he was 46 years of age, four colleges had honored him with degrees, and he had become chairman of the Democratic National Committee and Postmaster General of the United States. I once interviewed Jim Farley and asked him the secret of his success. He said, hard work and I said, don't be funny. He then asked me what I thought was the reason for his success. I replied, I understand you can call 10,000 people by their first names. No, you are wrong, he said. I can call 50,000 people by their first names. Make no mistake about it. That ability helped Mr. Farley put Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House when he managed Roosevelt's campaign in 1932. During the years that Jim Farley traveled as a salesman for a gypsum concern and during the years that he held office as town clerk in Stony Point, he built up a system for remembering names. In the beginning, it was a very simple one. Whenever he met a new acquaintance, he found out his or her complete name and some facts about his or her family, business and political opinions. He fixed all these facts well in mind as part of the picture and the next time he met that person, even if it was a year later, he was able to shake hands, inquire after the family, and ask about the hollow hawks in the backyard. No wonder he developed a following. For months before Roosevelt's campaign for president began, Jim Farley wrote hundreds of letters a day to people all over the western and northwestern states. Then he hopped onto a train and in 19 days covered 20 states and 12,000 miles, traveling by buggy train, automobile and boat. He would drop into town, meet his people at lunch or breakfast, tea or dinner, and give them a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Then he'd dash off again on another leg of his journey. As soon as he arrived back east, he wrote to one person in each town he had visited, asking for a list of all the guests to whom he had talked. The final list contained thousands and thousands of names, yet each person on that list was paid the subtle flattery of getting a personal letter from James Farley. These letters began Dear Bill or Dear Jane, and they were always signed Jim. Jim Farley discovered early in life that the average person is more interested in his or her own name than in all the other names on earth put together. Remember that name and call it easily, and you have paid a subtle and very effective compliment. But forget it or misspell it and you have placed yourself at a sharp disadvantage. For example, I once organized a public speaking course in Paris and sent form letters to all the American residents in the city. French typists with apparently little knowledge of English filled in the names and naturally they made blunders. One man, the manager of a large American bank in Paris, wrote me a scathing rebuke because his name had been misspelled. Sometimes it is difficult to remember a name, particularly if it is hard to pronounce, rather than even try to learn it. Many people ignore it or call the person by an easy nickname. Sid Levy called on a customer for some time whose name was Nicodemus Papadellos. Most people just called him Nick. Levy told us, I made a special effort to say his name over several times to myself before I made my call. When I greeted him by his full name, good afternoon Mr. Nicodemus Papadellos, he was shocked. For what seemed like several minutes there was no reply from him at all. Finally, he said with tears rolling down his cheeks, Mr. Levy, in all the 15 years I have been in this country, nobody has ever made the effort to call me by my right name. What was the reason for Andrew Carnegie's success? 
He was called the Steel King, yet he himself knew little about the manufacture of steel. He had hundreds of people working for him who knew far more about steel than he did, but he knew how to handle people, and that is what made him rich. Early in life, he showed a flair for organization, a genius for leadership. By the time he was 10, he too had discovered the astounding importance people place on their own name, and he used that discovery to win cooperation. To illustrate, when he was a boy back in Scotland, he got hold of a rabbit, a mother rabbit, presto. He soon had a whole nest of little rabbits and nothing to feed them. But he had a brilliant idea. He told the boys and girls in the neighborhood that if they would go out and pull enough clover and dandelions to feed the rabbits, he would name the bunnies in their honor. The plan worked like magic, and Carnegie never forgot it. Years later, he made millions by using the same psychology in business. For example, he wanted to sell steel rails to the Pennsylvania Railroad. J. Edgar Thompson was the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad then. So Andrew Carnegie built a huge steel mill in Pittsburgh and called it the Edgar Thompson Steel Works. Here is a riddle. See if you can guess it. When the Pennsylvania Railroad needed steel rails, where do you suppose J. Edgar Thompson bought them from Sears Roebuck? No, no, you're wrong. Guess again. When Carnegie and George Pullman were battling each other for supremacy in the railroad sleeping car business, the Steel King again remembered the lesson of the rabbits. The Central Transportation Company, which Andrew Carnegie controlled, was fighting with the company that Pullman owned. Both were struggling to get the sleeping car business of the Union Pacific Railroad, bucking each other, slashing prices, and destroying all chance of profit. Both Carnegie and Pullman had gone to New York to see the board of directors of the Union Pacific. Meeting one evening in the St. Nicholas Hotel, Carnegie said, Good evening Mr. Pullman, aren't we making a couple of fools of ourselves? What do you mean? Pullman demanded. Then Carnegie expressed what he had on his mind a merger of their two interests. He pictured in glowing terms the mutual advantages of working with instead of against each other. Pullman listened attentively, but he was not wholly convinced. Finally he asked, what would you call the new company? And Carnegie replied promptly, why, the Pullman Palace Car Company, of course. Pullman's face brightened. Come into my room, he said. Let's talk it over. That talk made industrial history. This policy of remembering and honoring the names of his friends and business associates was one of the secrets of Andrew Carnegie's leadership. He was proud of the fact that he could call many of his factory workers by their first names, and he boasted that while he was personally in charge, no strike ever disturbed his flaming steel mills. Benton Love Chairman of Texas Commerce Bank Shares, believes that the bigger a corporation gets, the colder it becomes. One way to warm it up, he said, is to remember people's names. The executive who tells me he can't remember names is at the same time telling me he can't remember a significant part of his business and is operating on quicksand. Karen Kersich of Rancho Palos Verdes, California a flight attendant for TWA, made it a practice to learn the names of as many passengers in her cabin as possible and use the name when serving them. This resulted in many compliments on her service expressed both to her directly and to the airline. One passenger wrote, I haven't flown TWA for some time, but I'm going to start flying nothing but TWA from now on. You make me feel that your airline has become a very personalized airline and that is important to me. People are so proud of their names that they strive to perpetuate them at any cost. Even blustering, hard-boiled old P.T. Barnum, the greatest showman of his time, disappointed because he had no sons to carry on his name, offered his grandson, C.H. Seeley, $25,000 if he would call himself Barnum Seeley. For many centuries, nobles and magnates supported artists, musicians, and authors, so that their creative works would be dedicated to them. Libraries and museums owe their richest collections to people who cannot bear to think that their names might perish from the memory of the race. The New York Public Library has its Astor and Lennox collections. The Metropolitan Museum perpetuates the names of Benjamin Altman and J.P. Morgan. And nearly every church is beautified by stained glass windows commemorating the names of their donors. 
Many of the buildings on the campus of most universities bear the names of donors who contributed large sums of money for this honor. Most people don't remember names for the simple reason that they don't take the time and energy necessary to concentrate and repeat and fix names indelibly in their minds. They make excuses for themselves, they are too busy, but they were probably no busier than Franklin D. Roosevelt and he took time to remember and recall even the names of mechanics with whom he came into contact. To illustrate, the Chrysler organization built a special car for Mr. Roosevelt, who could not use a standard car, because his legs were paralyzed. W.F. Chamberlain and a mechanic delivered it to the White House. I have in front of me a letter from Mr. Chamberlain relating his experiences. I taught President Roosevelt how to handle a car with a lot of unusual gadgets but he taught me a lot about the fine art of handling people. When I called at the White House Mr. Chamberlain writes, the president was extremely pleasant and cheerful. He called me by name, made me feel very comfortable, and particularly impressed me with the fact that he was vitally interested in things I had to show him and tell him. The car was so designed that it could be operated entirely by hand. A crowd gathered around to look at the car, and he remarked, I think it is marvelous, all you have to do is to touch a button, and it moves away, and you can drive it without effort, I think it is grand I don't know what makes it go, I'd love to have the time to tear it down and see how it works. When Roosevelt's friends and associates admired the machine, he said in their presence, Mr. Chamberlain, I certainly appreciate all the time and effort you have spent in developing this car, it is a mighty fine job, he admired the radiator, the special rear vision mirror and clock, the special spotlight, the kind of upholstery, the sitting position of the driver's seat, the special suitcases and the trunk with his monogram on each suitcase. In other words, he took notice of every detail to which he knew I had given considerable thought. He made a point of bringing these various pieces of equipment to the attention of Mrs. Roosevelt, Miss Perkins, the Secretary of Labor, and his secretary. He even brought the old White House porter into the picture by saying, George, you want to take particularly good care of the suitcases. When the driving lesson was finished, the president turned to me and said, well, Mr. Chamberlain, I have been keeping the Federal Reserve Board waiting 30 minutes. I guess I had better get back to work. I took a mechanic with me to the White House. He was introduced to Roosevelt when he arrived. He didn't talk to the president and Roosevelt heard his name only once. He was a shy chap and he kept in the background. But before leaving us, the president looked for the mechanic, shook his hand, called him by name, and thanked him for coming to Washington. And there was nothing perfunctory about his thanks. He meant what he said. I could feel that. A few days after returning to New York. I got an autographed photograph of President Roosevelt, and a little note of thanks again expressing his appreciation for my assistance. How he found time to do it is a mystery to me. Franklin D. Roosevelt knew that one of the simplest, most obvious and most important ways of gaining goodwill, was by remembering names and making people feel important yet. How many of us do it? Half the time we are introduced to a stranger. We chat a few minutes and can't even remember his or her name by the time we say goodbye. One of the first lessons a politician learns is this. To recall a voter's name is statesmanship, to forget it is oblivion, and the ability to remember names is almost as important in business and social contacts as it is in politics. Napoleon III, Emperor of France and nephew of the great Napoleon, boasted that in spite of all his royal duties, he could remember the name of every person he met. His technique, simple. If he didn't hear the name distinctly, he said, so sorry, I didn't get the name clearly. Then, if it was an unusual name, he would say, how is it spelled? During the conversation, he took the trouble to repeat the name several times and tried to associate it in his mind with the person's features, expression and general appearance. If the person was someone of importance, Napoleon went to even further pains. As soon as His Royal Highness was alone, he wrote the name down on a piece of paper, looked at it concentrated on it, fixed it securely in his mind, and then tore up the paper. In this way, he gained an eye impression of the name as well as an ear impression. All this takes time, but good manners, said Emerson, are made up of petty sacrifices. 
The importance of remembering and using names is not just the prerogative of kings and corporate executives, it works for all of us. Ken Nottingham, an employee of General Motors in Indiana, usually had lunch at the company cafeteria. He noticed that the woman who worked behind the counter always had a scowl on her face. She had been making sandwiches for about two hours, and I was just another sandwich to her. I told her what I wanted. She weighed out the ham on a little scale. Then she gave me one leaf of lettuce, a few potato chips, and handed them to me. The next day I went through the same line, same woman, same scowl. The only difference was I noticed her name tag. I smiled and said, hello, Eunice, and then told her what I wanted. Well, she forgot the scale, piled on the ham, gave me three leaves of lettuce, and heaped on the potato chips, until they fell off the plate. We should be aware of the magic contained in a name and realize that the single item is wholly and completely owned by the person with whom we are dealing and nobody else. The name sets the individual apart, it makes him or her unique among all others. The information we are imparting or the request we are making takes on a special importance when we approach the situation with the name of the individual. From the waitress to the senior executive, the name will work magic as we deal with others. Principle 3. Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. 7. An easy way to become a good conversationalist. Some time ago, I attended a bridge party. I don't play bridge, and there was a woman there who didn't play bridge either. She had discovered that I had once been Lowell Thomas's manager before he went on the radio, and that I had traveled in Europe a great deal. While helping him prepare the illustrated travel talks he was then delivering, so she said, Oh, Mr. Carnegie, I do want you to tell me about all the wonderful places you have visited and the sights you have seen. As we sat down on the sofa, she remarked that she and her husband had recently returned from a trip to Africa. Africa, I exclaimed, how interesting, I've always wanted to see Africa, but I never got there except for a 24-hour stay once in Algiers. Tell me, did you visit the big game country? Yes. How fortunate, I envy you. Do tell me about Africa. That kept her talking for 45 minutes. She never again asked me where I had been or what I had seen. She didn't want to hear me talk about my travels. All she wanted was an interested listener. So she could expand her ego and tell about where she had been. Was she unusual? No. Many people are like that. For example, I met a distinguished botanist at a dinner party given by a New York book publisher. I had never talked with a botanist before and I found him fascinating. I literally sat on the edge of my chair and listened while he spoke of exotic plants and experiments in developing new forms of plant life and indoor gardens, and even told me astonishing facts about the humble potato. I had a small indoor garden of my own, and he was good enough to tell me how to solve some of my problems. As I said, we were at a dinner party. There must have been a dozen other guests, but I violated all the canons of courtesy, ignored everyone else, and talked for hours to the botanist. Midnight came. I said good night to everyone and departed. The botanist then turned to our host and paid me several flattering compliments. I was most stimulating. I was this and I was that. And he ended by saying I was a most interesting conversationalist. An interesting conversationalist. Why, I had said hardly anything at all. I couldn't have said anything if I had wanted to without changing the subject, for I didn't know any more about botany than I knew about the anatomy of a penguin. But I had done this. I had listened intently. I had listened because I was genuinely interested, and he felt it. Naturally that pleased him. That kind of listening is one of the highest compliments we can pay anyone. Few human beings wrote Jack Woodford in Strangers in Love. Few human beings are proof against the implied flattery of rapt attention. I went even further than giving him rapt attention. I was hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise. I told him that I had been immensely entertained and instructed and I had. I told him I wished I had his knowledge and I did. I told him that I should love to wander the fields with him and I have. I told him I must see him again and I did. And so I had him thinking of me as a good conversationalist when, in reality, I had been merely a good listener and had encouraged him to talk. 
What is the secret, the mystery of a successful business interview? Well, according to former Harvard president Charles W. Eliot, there is no mystery about successful business intercourse exclusive attention to the person who is speaking to you is very important. Nothing else is so flattering as that. Eliot himself was a past master of the art of listening. Henry James, one of America's first great novelists, recalled, Dr. Eliot's listening was not mere silence, but a form of activity, sitting very erect on the end of his spine with hands joined in his lap, making no movement, except that he revolved his thumbs around each other faster or slower, he faced his interlocutor, and seemed to be hearing with his eyes as well as his ears. He listened with his mind and attentively considered what you had to say while you said it. At the end of an interview the person who had talked to him felt that he had had his say. Self-evident, isn't it? You don't have to study for four years in Harvard to discover that. Yet I know and you know department store owners who will rent expensive space, buy their goods economically, dress their windows appealingly, spend thousands of dollars in advertising, and then hire clerks who haven't the sense to be good listeners clerks who interrupt customers, contradict them, irritate them, and all but drive them from the store. A department store in Chicago almost lost a regular customer who spent several thousand dollars each year in that store because a sales clerk wouldn't listen. Mrs. Henrietta Douglas, who took our course in Chicago, had purchased a coat at a special sale. After she had brought it home, she noticed that there was a tear in the lining. She came back the next day and asked the sales clerk to exchange it. The clerk refused even to listen to her complaint. You bought this at a special sale she said. She pointed to a sign on the wall. Read that she exclaimed. All sales are final. Once you bought it, you have to keep it. Sew up the lining yourself. But this was damaged merchandise Mrs. Douglas complained. Makes no difference the clerk interrupted. Finals final. Mrs. Douglas was about to walk out indignantly, swearing never to return to that store ever, when she was greeted by the department manager, who knew her from her many years of patronage. Mrs. Douglas told her what had happened. The manager listened attentively to the whole story, examined the code and then said, special sales are final so we can dispose of merchandise at the end of the season, but this no-return policy does not apply to damaged goods. We will certainly repair or replace the lining, or if you prefer, give you your money back. What a difference in treatment. If that manager had not come along and listened to the customer, a long-term patron of that store could have been lost forever. Listening is just as important in one's home life as in the world of business. Millie Esposito of Croton on Hudson, New York made it her business to listen carefully when one of her children wanted to speak with her. One evening she was sitting in the kitchen with her son, Robert, and after a brief discussion of something that was on his mind, Robert said, Mom, I know that you love me very much. Mrs. Esposito was touched and said, Of course I love you very much. Did you doubt it? Robert responded, No, but I really know you love me because whenever I want to talk to you about something you stop whatever you are doing and listen to me. The chronic kicker, even the most violent critic, will frequently soften and be subdued in the presence of a patient, sympathetic listener or listener, who will he silent, while the irate fault finder dilates like a king cobra and spews the poison out of his system. To illustrate, the New York Telephone Company discovered a few years ago that it had to deal with one of the most vicious customers who ever cursed a customer service representative, and he did curse, he raved, he threatened to tear the phone out by its roots, he refused to pay certain charges that he declared were false, he wrote letters to the newspapers, he filed innumerable complaints with the Public Service Commission, and he started several suits against the telephone company. At last, one of the company's most skillful troubleshooters was sent to interview this stormy petrol. This troubleshooter listened and let the cantankerous customer enjoy himself pouring out his tirade. The telephone representative listened and said yes and sympathized with his grievance. He raved on, and I listened for nearly three hours, the troubleshooter said, as he related his experiences before one of the author's classes. Then I went back and listened some more. I interviewed him four times, and before the fourth visit was over, I had become a charter member of an organization he was starting. He called it the Telephone Subscribers Protective Association. 
I am still a member of this organization, and, so far as I know, I'm the only member in the world today besides Mr. I listened and sympathized with him on every point that he made during these interviews. He had never had a telephone representative talk with him that way before, and he became almost friendly. The point on which I went to see him was not even mentioned on the first visit, nor was it mentioned on the second or third, but upon the fourth interview, I closed the case completely, he paid all his bills in full, and for the first time in the history of his difficulties with the telephone company, he voluntarily withdrew his complaints from the Public Service Commission. Doubtless Mr. had considered himself a holy crusader, defending the public rights against callous exploitation. But in reality, what he had really wanted was a feeling of importance. He got this feeling of importance at first by kicking and complaining, but as soon as he got his feeling of importance from a representative of the company, his imagined grievances vanished into thin air. One morning years ago, an angry customer stormed into the office of Julian F. Detmer, founder of the Detmer Woolen Company, which later became the world's largest distributor of woolens to the tailoring trade. This man owed us a small sum of money Mr. Detmer explained to me. The customer denied it, but we knew he was wrong, so our credit department had insisted that he pay. After getting a number of letters from our credit department, he packed his grip, made a trip to Chicago, and hurried into my office to inform me not only that he was not going to pay that bill, but that he was never going to buy another dollar's worth of goods from the Detmer Woolen Company. I listened patiently to all he had to say. I was tempted to interrupt, but I realized that would be bad policy, so I let him talk himself out. When he finally simmered down and got in a receptive mood, I said quietly, I want to thank you for coming to Chicago to tell me about this. You have done me a great favor, for if our credit department has annoyed you, it may annoy other good customers, and that would be just too bad. Believe me, I am far more eager to hear this than you are to tell it. That was the last thing in the world he expected me to say. I think he was a trifle disappointed, because he had come to Chicago to tell me a thing or two, but here I was thanking him instead of scrapping with him. I assured him we would wipe the charge off the books and forget it because he was a very careful man with only one account to look after, while our clerks had to look after thousands. Therefore, he was less likely to be wrong than we were. I told him that I understood exactly how he felt, and that, if I were in his shoes, I should undoubtedly feel precisely as he did. Since he wasn't going to buy from us anymore, I recommended some other woolen houses. In the past, we had usually lunched together when he came to Chicago, so I invited him to have lunch with me this day. He accepted reluctantly, but when we came back to the office, he placed a larger order than ever before. He returned home in a softened mood and, wanting to be just as fair with us as we had been with him, looked over his bills, found one that had been mislaid, and sent us a check with his apologies. Later, when his wife presented him with a baby boy, he gave his son the middle name of Detmer and he remained a friend and customer of the house until his death 22 years afterwards. Years ago, a poor Dutch immigrant boy washed the windows of a bakery shop after school to help support his family. His people were so poor that in addition he used to go out in the street with a basket every day and collect stray bits of coal that had fallen in the gutter where the coal wagons had delivered fuel. That boy, Edward Bach, never got more than six years of schooling in his life, yet eventually he made himself one of the most successful magazine editors in the history of American journalism. How did he do it? That is a long story, but how he got his start can be told briefly. He got his start by using the principles advocated in this chapter. He left school when he was 13 and became an office boy for Western Union but he didn't for one moment give up the idea of an education. Instead, he started to educate himself. He saved his car fares and went without lunch until he had enough money to buy an encyclopedia of American biography and then he did an unheard of thing. He read the lives of famous people and wrote them asking for additional information about their childhoods. He was a good listener, he asked famous people to tell him more about themselves. He wrote General James A. Garfield, who was then running for president, and asked if it was true that he was once a towboy on a canal, and Garfield replied, 
He wrote General Grant asking about a certain battle, and Grant drew a map for him and invited this 14-year-old boy to dinner and spent the evening talking to him. Soon our Western Union messenger boy was corresponding with many of the most famous people in the nation. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Longfellow, Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, Louisa May Alcott, General Sherman and Jefferson Davis. Not only did he correspond with these distinguished people, but as soon as he got a vacation, he visited many of them as a welcome guest in their homes. This experience imbued him with a confidence that was invaluable. These men and women fired him with a vision and ambition that shaped his life. And all this, let me repeat, was made possible solely by the application of the principles we are discussing here. Isaac F. Marcassen, a journalist who interviewed hundreds of celebrities, declared that many people fail to make a favorable impression because they don't listen attentively. They have been so much concerned with what they are going to say next that they do not keep their ears open. Very important people have told me that they prefer good listeners to good talkers, but the ability to listen seems rarer than almost any other good trait. And not only important personages crave a good listener, but ordinary folk do too. As the Reader's Digest once said, many persons call a doctor when all they want is an audience. During the darkest hours of the Civil War, Lincoln wrote to an old friend in Springfield, Illinois, asking him to come to Washington. Lincoln said he had some problems he wanted to discuss with him. The old neighbor called at the White House, and Lincoln talked to him for hours about the advisability of issuing a proclamation freeing the slaves. Lincoln went over all the arguments for and against such a move and then read letters and newspaper articles, some denouncing him for not freeing the slaves and others denouncing him for fear he was going to free them. After talking for hours, Lincoln shook hands with his old neighbor, said good night, and sent him back to Illinois without even asking for his opinion. Lincoln had done all the talking himself, that seemed to clarify his mind, he seemed to feel easier after that talk the old friend said, Lincoln hadn't wanted advice, he had wanted merely a friendly, sympathetic listener, to whom he could unburden himself, that's what we all want when we are in trouble. That is frequently all the irritated customer wants, and the dissatisfied employee or the hurt friend. One of the great listeners of modern times was Sigmund Freud. A man who met Freud described his manner of listening, it struck me so forcibly that I shall never forget him. He had qualities which I had never seen in any other man. Never had I seen such concentrated attention. There was none of that piercing soul-penetrating gaze business. His eyes were mild and genial. His voice was low and kind, his gestures were few, but the attention he gave me, his appreciation of what I said, even when I said it badly, was extraordinary. You've no idea what it meant to be listened to like that. If you want to know how to make people shun you and laugh at you behind your back and even despise you, here is the recipe. Never listen to anyone for long, talk incessantly about yourself. If you have an idea while the other person is talking, don't wait for him or her to finish, bust right in and interrupt in the middle of a sentence. Do you know people like that? I do, unfortunately, and the astonishing part of it is that some of them are prominent. Bores, that is all they are bores intoxicated with their own egos, drunk with a sense of their own importance. People who talk only of themselves think only of themselves. And those people who think only of themselves Dr. Nicholas Murray Butler, longtime president of Columbia University, said are hopelessly uneducated. They are not educated said Dr. Butler, no matter how instructed they may be. So if you aspire to be a good conversationalist, be an attentive listener. To be interesting, be interested. Ask questions that other persons will enjoy answering. Encourage them to talk about themselves and their accomplishments. Remember that the people you are talking to are a hundred times more interested in themselves and their wants and problems than they are in you and your problems. A person's toothache means more to that person than a famine in China, which kills a million people. A boil on one's neck interests one more than 40 earthquakes in Africa. Think of that the next time you start a conversation. Principle 4. Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. 8. How to interest people. Everyone who was ever a guest of Theodore Roosevelt was astonished at the range and diversity of his knowledge. Whether his visitor was a cowboy or a rough rider, 
a New York politician or a diplomat, Roosevelt knew what to say. And how was it done? The answer was simple. Whenever Roosevelt expected a visitor, he sat up late the night before, reading up on the subject in which he knew his guest was particularly interested. For Roosevelt knew, as all leaders know, that the royal road to a person's heart is to talk about the things he or she treasures most. The genial William Lyon Phelps, essayist and professor of literature at Yale, learned this lesson early in life. When I was eight years old and was spending a weekend visiting my Aunt Libby Lindsley at her home in Stratford on the Housatonic he wrote in his essay on human nature, a middle-aged man called one evening, and after a polite skirmish with my aunt, he devoted his attention to me. At that time, I happened to be excited about boats, and the visitor discussed the subject in a way that seemed to me particularly interesting. After he left, I spoke of him with enthusiasm. What a man! My aunt informed me he was a New York lawyer, that he cared nothing whatever about boats that he took not the slightest interest in the subject. But why then did he talk all the time about boats? Because he is a gentleman. He saw you were interested in boats, and he talked about the things he knew would interest and please you. He made himself agreeable. And William Lyon Phelps added, I never forgot my aunt's remark. As I write this chapter, I have before me a letter from Edward L. Chaliff, who was active in Boy Scout work. One day I found I needed a favor wrote Mr. Chaliff. A big scout jamboree was coming off in Europe and I wanted the president of one of the largest corporations in America to pay the expenses of one of my boys for the trip. Fortunately, just before I went to see this man, I heard that he had drawn a check for a million dollars, and that after it was cancelled, he had had it framed. So the first thing I did when I entered his office was to ask to see the check. A check for a million dollars. I told him I never knew that anybody had ever written such a check and that I wanted to tell my boys that I had actually seen a check for a million dollars. He gladly showed it to me, I admired it and asked him to tell me all about how it happened to be drawn. You notice, don't you, that Mr. Chaliff didn't begin by talking about the Boy Scouts, or the Jamboree in Europe, or what it was he wanted. He talked in terms of what interested the other man. Here is the result. Presently, the man I was interviewing said, Oh, by the way, what was it you wanted to see me about? So I told him. To my vast surprise Mr. Chaliff continues, he not only granted immediately what I asked for, but much more. I had asked him to send only one boy to Europe, but he sent five boys and myself, gave me a letter of credit for a thousand dollars, and told us to stay in Europe for seven weeks. He also gave me letters of introduction to his branch presidents, putting them at our service and he himself met us in Paris and showed us the town. Since then, he has given jobs to some of the boys whose parents were in want, and he is still active in our group. Yet I know if I hadn't found out what he was interested in, and got him warmed up first, I wouldn't have found him one-tenth as easy to approach. Is this a valuable technique to use in business, is it? Let's see, take Henry G. Duvernoy of Duvamoy & Sons, a wholesale baking firm in New York. Mr. Duvernoy had been trying to sell bread to a certain New York hotel. He had called on the manager every week for four years. He went to the same social affairs the manager attended. He even took rooms in the hotel and lived there in order to get the business, but he failed. Then said Mr. Duvernoy, after studying human relations, I resolved to change my tactics. I decided to find out what interested this man what caught his enthusiasm. I discovered he belonged to a society of hotel executives called the Hotel Greeters of America. He not only belonged, but his bubbling enthusiasm had made him president of the organization and president of the international greeters. No matter where its conventions were held, he would be there. So when I saw him the next day, I began talking about the greeters. What a response I got. What a response. He talked to me for half an hour about the greeters, his tones vibrant with enthusiasm. I could plainly see that this society was not only his hobby, it was the passion of his life. Before I left his office, he had sold me a membership in his organization. In the meantime, I had said nothing about bread, but a few days later, the steward of his hotel phoned me to come over with samples and prices. I don't know what you did to the old boy the steward greeted me, but he sure is sold on you. 
Think of it. I had been drumming at that man for four years trying to get his business and I'd still be drumming at him if I hadn't finally taken the trouble to find out what he was interested in and what he enjoyed talking about. Edward E. Harriman of Hagerstown, Maryland, chose to live in the beautiful Cumberland Valley of Maryland after he completed his military service. Unfortunately, at that time there were few jobs available in the area. A little research uncovered the fact that a number of companies in the area were either owned or controlled by an unusual business maverick, R.J. Funkhauser, whose rise from poverty to riches intrigued Mr. Harriman. However, he was known for being inaccessible to job seekers. Mr. Harriman wrote, I interviewed a number of people and found that his major interest was anchored in his drive for power and money, since he protected himself from people like me by use of a dedicated and stern secretary. I studied her interests and goals, and only then I paid an unannounced visit at her office. She had been Mr. Funkhauser's orbiting satellite for about 15 years. When I told her I had a proposition for him which might translate itself into financial and political success for him, she became enthused. I also conversed with her about her constructive participation in his success. After this conversation she arranged for me to meet Mr. Funkhauser. I entered his huge and impressive office, determined not to ask directly for a job. He was seated behind a large carved desk and thundered at me. How about it, young man? I said, Mr. Funkhauser, I believe I can make money for you. He immediately rose and invited me to sit in one of the large upholstered chairs. I enumerated my ideas and the qualifications I had to realize these ideas as well as how they would contribute to his personal success and that of his businesses. RJ, as he became known to me, hired me at once and for over 20 years I have grown in his enterprises, and we both have prospered. Talking in terms of the other person's interests pays off for both parties. Howard Z. Herzig, a leader in the field of employee communications, has always followed this principle. When asked what reward he got from it, Mr. Herzig responded that he not only received a different reward from each person, but that in general, the reward had been an enlargement of his life each time he spoke to someone. Principle 5. Talk in terms of the other person's interests. 9. How to make people like you instantly. I was waiting in line to register a letter in the post office at 33rd Street and 8th Avenue in New York. I noticed that the clerk appeared to be bored with the job weighing envelopes, handing out stamps, making change, issuing receipts the same monotonous grind year after year. So I said to myself, I am going to try to make that clerk like me. Obviously, to make him like me, I must say something nice. Not about myself, but about him. So I ask myself, what is there about him that I can honestly admire? That is sometimes a hard question to answer, especially with strangers, but, in this case, it happened to be easy. I instantly saw something I admired no end. So while he was weighing my envelope, I remarked with enthusiasm, I certainly wish I had your head of hair. He looked up, half startled, his face beaming with smiles. Well, it isn't as good as it used to be he said modestly. I assured him that although it might have lost some of its pristine glory, nevertheless it was still magnificent. He was immensely pleased, we carried on a pleasant little conversation, and the last thing he said to me was, many people have admired my hair. I'll bet that person went out to lunch that day walking on air. I'll bet he went home that night and told his wife about it. I'll bet he looked in the mirror and said, it is a beautiful head of hair. I told this story once in public and a man asked me afterwards, what did you want to get out of him? What was I trying to get out of him? What was I trying to get out of him? If we are so contemptibly selfish that we can't radiate a little happiness and pass on a bit of honest appreciation without trying to get something out of the other person in return if our souls are no bigger than sour crab apples, we shall meet with the failure we so richly deserve. Oh yes, I did want something out of that chap. I wanted something priceless, and I got it. I got the feeling that I had done something for him without his being able to do anything whatever in return for me. That is a feeling that flows and sings in your memory long after the incident has passed. There is one all-important law of human conduct. If we obey that law, we shall almost never get into trouble. In fact, that law, if obeyed, will bring us countless friends and constant happiness. But the very instant we break the law, 
we shall get into endless trouble. The law is this, always make the other person feel important. John Dewey, as we have already noted, said that the desire to be important is the deepest urge in human nature, and William James said, the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. As I have already pointed out, it is this urge that differentiates us from the animals, it is this urge that has been responsible for civilization itself. Philosophers have been speculating on the rules of human relationships for thousands of years, and out of all that speculation, there has evolved only one important precept. It is not new, it is as old as history. Zoroaster taught it to his followers in Persia 2500 years ago. Confucius preached it in China 24 centuries ago. Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, taught it to his disciples in the Valley of the Han. Buddha preached it on the bank of the Holy Ganges 500 years before Christ. The sacred books of Hinduism taught it a thousand years before that. Jesus taught it among the stony hills of Judah 19 centuries ago. Jesus summed it up in one thought probably the most important rule in the world. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. You want the approval of those with whom you come in contact. You want recognition of your true worth. You want a feeling that you are important in your little world. You don't want to listen to cheap and sincere flattery. But you do crave sincere appreciation. You want your friends and associates to be, as Charles Schwab put it, hearty in their approbation and lavish in their praise. All of us want that. So let's obey the golden rule and give unto others what we would have others give unto us. How? When? Where? The answer is, all the time, everywhere. David G. Smith of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, told one of our classes how he handled a delicate situation. When he was asked to take charge of the refreshment booth at a charity concert, the night of the concert, I arrived at the park and found two elderly ladies in a very bad humor standing next to the refreshment stand. Apparently each thought that she was in charge of this project. As I stood there pondering what to do, me of the members of the sponsoring committee appeared and handed me a cash box and thanked me for taking over the project. She introduced Rose and Jane as my helpers and then ran off. A great silence ensued. Realizing that the cash box was a symbol of authority, of sorts, I gave the box to Rose and explained that I might not be able to keep the money straight and that if she took care of it, I would feel better. I then suggested to Jane that she show two teenagers who had been assigned to refreshments how to operate the soda machine, and I asked her to be responsible for that part of the project. The evening was very enjoyable with Rose happily counting the money, Jane supervising the teenagers, and me enjoying the concert. You don't have to wait until you are ambassador to France or chairman of the Clambic Committee of your lodge before you use this philosophy of appreciation. You can work magic with it almost every day. If, for example, the waitress brings us mashed potatoes when we have ordered french fries, let's say, I'm sorry to trouble you, but I prefer french fries, she'll probably reply, no trouble at all, and will be glad to change the potatoes, because we have shown respect for her. Little phrases such as I'm sorry to trouble you would you be so kind as to, won't you please, would you mind? Thank you little courtesies like these oil the cogs of the monotonous grind of everyday life and, incidentally, they are the hallmark of good breeding. Let's take another illustration. Hall Kane's novels The Christian, The Deemster, The Manxman, among them were all bestsellers in the early part of this century. Millions of people read his novels, countless millions. He was the son of a blacksmith, he never had more than eight years of schooling in his life. Yet when he died he was the richest literary man of his time. The story goes like this. Hall Kane loved sonnets and ballads. So he devoured all of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's poetry. He even wrote a lecture chanting the praises of Rossetti's artistic achievement and sent a copy to Rossetti himself. Rossetti was delighted. Any young man who has such an exalted opinion of my ability Rossetti probably said to himself must be brilliant so Rossetti invited this blacksmith's son to come to London and act as his secretary. That was the turning point in Hall Kane's life for, in his new position, he met the literary artists of the day. Profiting by their advice and inspired by their encouragement, he launched upon a career that emblazoned his name across the sky. His home, Griba Castle, on the Isle of Man, became a mecca for tourists from the far corners of the world, 
and he left a multi-million dollar estate, yet who knows he might have died poor and unknown, had he not written an essay expressing his admiration for a famous man, such as the power, the stupendous power, of sincere, heartfelt appreciation. Rossetti considered himself important, that is not strange, almost everyone considers himself important, very important. The life of many a person could probably be changed if only someone would make him feel important. Ronald J. Rowland, who is one of the instructors of our course in California, is also a teacher of arts and crafts. He wrote to us about a student named Chris in his beginning crafts class. Chris was a very quiet, shy boy lacking in self-confidence, the kind of student that often does not receive the attention he deserves. I also teach an advanced class that had grown to be somewhat of a status symbol and a privilege for a student to have earned the right to be in it. On Wednesday, Chris was diligently working at his desk. I really felt there was a hidden fire deep inside him. I asked Chris if he would like to be in the advanced class. How I wish I could express the look in Chris's face, the emotions in that shy 14-year-old boy, trying to hold back his tears. Who me Mr. Roland, am I good enough? Yes, Chris, you are good enough. I had to leave at that point because tears were coming to my eyes. As Chris walked out of class that day, seemingly two inches taller, he looked at me with bright blue eyes and said in a positive voice, Thank you Mr. Roland. Chris taught me a lesson I will never forget our deep desire to feel important. To help me never forget this rule, I made a sign which reads you are important. This sign hangs in the front of the classroom for all to see and to remind me that each student I face is equally important. The unvarnished truth is that almost all the people you meet feel themselves superior to you in some way and a sure way to their hearts is to let them realize in some subtle way that you recognize their importance and recognize it sincerely.